Bungie definitely kind of they seem surprised by the community surprise that there weren't loads of developers yeah. still working on bungie is very capable studio if they wanted to divert their entire workforce onto just destiny it would be a completely different game but the reason they're not doing it is because since we last spoke a lot has come out a lot that we got to talk about as always we'll try and get through all of it but we'll see if we can it's gonna be a lot of talking so hopefully that's what you're into if you're watching this but um yeah we're going to talk a lot about the future of destiny 2 and what the game's kind of going to look like after final shape i think that's kind of the biggest question that everyone's wondering but i think it's going to be honestly it didn't um how do i describe it i don't think i don't think what i expected is definitely i think the outcome of what destiny is going to look like is a bit different to what i expected i think in a good way i think there's some things that people have said they're unhappy about but i think generally speaking I think the future of Destiny 2 in particular, it wasn't as, um, like before the showcase, it was very doom and gloom, a lot of complaining, a lot of like doought, a lot of, um, what was the word that we used? Um, That's a good question. The one that comes to mind is discontent, but. Um, yeah, that's another one. Discontent. Um, of restlessness, that was the word. Restlessness, restlessness. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I think there's still a bit there, but I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff. A lot of interesting stuff we'll get to. Um, one thing I do want to ask is for, I think, future episodes, something I'd like to do is uh, create a question. So if any of you guys are watching or listening, and if you have any questions that you kind of, or topics you'd like to see discussed on the show, you can drop them in the comments or tweet me and just type create a question or CC and then your question. And it can be about anything. It can be about Destiny, it can be about games, it can be about, I think mainly I'd like it to be about content creation. If you have anything that you'd like to ask to creators about content creation, about videos, about thumbnails, about tags about any of the little kind of nitty gritty stuff that's the stuff that i personally really enjoy talking about I could talk about forever i think all creators do i mean when we sit around we a lot talk about like the meta and the back end and like all the kind of back end secrety stuff about youtube so i'd like to do more of that on the podcast so if there's anyone who has any questions then i'm sure a lot of you guys are aspiring content creators that create content yourself of any size whether you have 100 subs or 100,000 um i'm always interested in talking about that kind of that kind of element so if you have any questions drop them down below and we may possibly discuss them on um on future episodes so drop those great mm. questions down below and i think the first thing that we should get into is the future of destiny beyond final shape which was the big kind of uh looming question of what even happens is destiny going to end is destiny going to be over are they going to make a destiny 3 is there going to be more expansions what are we going to expect now the big kind of main answer to that is episodes which i think is very interesting um what do you think about episodes and the future of destiny so i think it really comes down to how you slice it right and uh i think the prevailing thought is that despite the fact that it probably delivers more content and is a bit more consistent as far as the yearly flow Destiny's seasonal model does not work for everybody. There's a lot of discontent. I see people regularly talking about how they wish they could go back to the days of um, Warmind and Curse of Osiris type expansions. I am vehemently not of that <laughs> that's crowd. A, that's a wild statement. That's, that's, you <laughs> I know, do see I it though. I do yep. see it. it. It's a sentiment that's out there in the wild. I mm. feel like some people have forgotten yeah. what times were like in those expansions. Mm. I don't mean to be condescending when I say that. It's just... I, my personal opinion is that those times were really grim. I remember it being like, people talk about how bad it, it is now or how bad it was like during the season of the deep and people's negative sentiment around Lightfall. I remember what it was like after Curse of Osiris. I remember what it was like after the dark below. It was bad. Mm. <laughs> it was really bad. Yeah. It was not okay. I think people are kind of pick and choosing <laughs> based with nostalgia, the good that was back then and kind of think, yeah, well, mm. let's go back to those times. If you go back, it's like, oh, actually, there wasn't all that much to do. And, right. um, and like, it's here's the thing, like there were some good points during those expansions. I mean, if you look at House of Wolves, for example, you had what I consider to be the first somewhat coherent story in Destiny. Trials of Osiris launched to Prison of Elders was somewhat replayable. You know, you had some good in there, mm. but it does not change the fact that Curse of Osiris and Warmind and Dark Below were really not great in terms of what people expect now for content. Mm. I'll say this, though. The new format that they're looking at, Episodes, looks as though it's this 
really interesting middle ground between the two, right? Mm. So instead of um, having... Yeah, it's a compromise, right? So instead of having um, two big expansions, I say big expansions, let's let's rephrase that. Two mini expansions <laughs> every year because mm. they're not... This is not Forsaken. This is not uh, Witch Queen. These are not actual expansion, size expansions. These are... You know, these are a destination and a three mission story sometimes, or a five mission story. You know, with like, two of those missions being like, strikes. Just go hit. <laughs> yeah, sometimes even strikes. There was the what the garden strike and the um, the oh, going uh, into the, Mercury. There was the and they were and get, campaign yeah. missions. I re- yeah, that was that was wild. <laughs> it was just like the whole campaign is like, hang on, aren't these strikes? And then you go play them after, and they're strikes. It's like. Wait a minute, there's like oh. five missions and two of them are strikes? What's, what's going on here? I remember that. But yeah, like all of that aside, you you have that middle ground between the expansion uh, that you would get out of something like, say, Warmind and Curse of Osiris and what you have currently with the seasonal model, which is an interesting choice. And I feel like people are, generally speaking, pretty receptive to charting that middle ground. Mm. So the way that things are working out, instead of two expansions every year, uh, or four seasons every year, what's happening now is supposedly they're breaking it down into a new structure called episodes. Mm. And there are supposed to be three episodes every year. And each episode is a 18-week period, I believe. Mm-hmm. And they stated that within each of these 18-week periods, each episode will have three acts, which is where this gets really interesting because apparently it means that every six weeks, there's a new kind of story beat that's going on. Mm-hmm. And whilst each episode supposedly has its own internal themes, such as, say, uh, Heretic or whatever the other ones uh, are called. Echoes, I think, is the first point being, whatever the overarching theme of the act is, you know, um, or sorry, whatever the overarching theme of the episode is, each act has its own sort of take on that and is a new story Mm. beat. And those drop every six weeks, which is, I mean, that's actually, assuming that it's a decent sized content drop, that's actually a pretty strong content cadence. Mm. We also still have to acknowledge we don't know what this looks like, right? Because new content every six weeks with a new act sounds pretty good, but that's a month and a half between each thing. And we also don't know what each thing for each episode really delivers, Mm. right? So what we could be looking at is, you know, a sizable set of story missions every time that one of these drops... And if that is the case, you know, every six weeks getting new story content. Interesting. Not totally sure how I feel about it, but it is definitely something where I feel as though it might satisfy that middle ground. Mm. As far as the leveling and season pass structure that they've got going on, they'll still have a season pass. They are stating that instead of having four every year, one for each season, they're going to have three each year, one for each episode. Mm. And that each one of them now will have rewards going all the way up to 200 levels. Yeah. Which is interesting. Um, yeah. I, th- I think I'm that's the real... It. Yeah, I, I think that's where a lot of the real negative sentiment around episodes has come from. Right. If any. Because generally, I think the idea has been received well and people are receptive to it. But the idea of pushing 200 levels worth of rewards across mm. 18 weeks is a lot. Now, let's yeah. be real. If there's good engagement, I think it's not impossible that people will come along and actually get that done. The first act of each um, episode is supposed to reveal the first hundred ranks worth of rewards. Mm -hmm. Then after that, each subsequent act reveals the next 50 ranks Mm. of the pass. So it goes 100, 150, 200 by the time that the third act of that uh, individual episode is done. But still, it's a very... I mean, right now, people are being asked to grind 100 levels on a season pass. Mm -hmm. And that feels like a lot. And technically, you know, you get 18 weeks as opposed to the shorter amount of time that you get currently. It is more time to get it done. So it's not impossible. You know, you're getting a bit more time to get a bit more stuff done. But it is still one of those things of like, this is driving player engagement. And I uh, it feels kind of anti-player. Yeah. Like, I, I say kind of. It is It is anti-player, to be brutally honest. You I know? kind of wonder about the retention of the episodes and how it's going like, to keep players' interest for a lot of reasons. I mean, A, for the, as you said, 200 levels is it's, it's daunting. Like, as we know, de- yeah. like, the leveling system in Destiny, and they've, we'll talk about the other leveling uh, changes they're making, which are very, very good. 
But so they've kind of fixed that problem of the level grind, which is keeps most players from achieving a lot of content they might want to play. But it's just like, ah, oh, do I want to go and do 50 Gambit matches or however many pinnacles just to get to this level, just to do this content? Um, but I think the one interesting thing about the uh, the acts is a little bit confusing, a lot of wordplay, but the episodes, also the episodes of three different acts. But if you have, I'm kind of wondering about the retention of the final, like the final act, the third act in an episode. I wonder like if there's only six weeks left of that episode, how much a player is going to want to grind out that final six weeks. And also with every act, there's going to be another row of uh, artifact mods, like the um, the season artifact is going to be a new row added. I kind of wonder if it's like the whatever's added in that final, like will there be enough time to play with those new perks in the final six weeks versus the first like two uh, acts? I'm trying to remember the terminology, but the first two acts, the first act, obviously you get all new stuff and the second act, but I'm wondering by the third act, are people still going to be, is there enough time to kind of play with that new stuff? I feel like it's going to be, I don't know, it's going to be interesting to see how they deal with the retention of it. And I think as well as that, there's also the topic of how are they going to like play into each other? Because we know that they're going to be very self-contained. So that in itself is is good. It's something I kind of predicted. I imagine they would, after Final Shape, just kind of go into spin-off stories. That was always kind of what I imagined and speculated they'd do. It makes the most sense, just spin-off stories they're not going to do. Once the main villain, the witness, is dead, kind of what else is there to tell that is significant? So it makes sense for them to branch off into different stories. But I think with the stories being self-contained, it's good because, as they said, like, you can be a brand new player and hop in and they even said you don't have to play them in the same order kind of like black mirror i guess you can just play any mm. episode and it's not you don't feel like you've missed out which is definitely good for um keeping consistency but i think the downside of that is the continuous as they said soap opera story that's going on it's kind of a reason to keep playing because you want to find out okay what's happening with sabathon now and then they've got this new enemy that's coming in and what's happening with the witness and you're kind of you're playing this because you know it's going to lead to something else. But if you're playing an episode and it's just kind of like, this is a random Vex story or a random Scorn story or a random Hive story with Heresy, it's, um, I wonder a play is going to be that glued to the story if they know the next season is just kind of another spin-off, if that makes sense. Like, I wonder, without a consistent story, is it going to be that, like, oh, I need to play this because I want to know what's going to happen with this character. If it's all just kind of, like, disconnected... I wonder how players are going to be, especially from from your perspective, from a story perspective, with no continuous one. I wonder how players are going to continually be interested. What do you think about that? I think that is really the, as far as narrative is concerned, that's the million dollar question. It's how do you keep people invested after Final Shape? And what I'd say about that is that, and this kind of bridges into a different topic slightly, so forgive me for jumping around the script a wee bit, but... There is a hint, an indication that was given that after the story of Final Shape is concluded, the episodes are all a reaction to that. Mm -hmm. You know, the world around us changes dramatically with the conclusion of the Final Shape is the kind of vibe that they were giving from the showcase reveal. And the episodes being a reaction to that, I think, makes sense, because if it is something as big as The Witness and The Traveler and their story coming to a close it's likely that that changes the entirety of the universe. And sitting there and checking in with all these relevant factions, for this year, at the very least, assuming that the changes are big and are breathtaking and are really capable of delivering this groundswell of story questions, I think that's good. You know, that is fine. The real question for that becomes, okay, so how do you maintain this over the next year? And the next because, year and the next year. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, I'm, I'm also going to nip this little point in the bud. Destiny is not finished. <laughs> Let's mm. be really, really clear. The game is Bungie's currently only seller. I know that Marathon is around the corner at some point, mm. several years out from development still, though. Uh, and they have no intention of losing their audience. Even if people do go ahead and decide to move on, I think Bungie is going to pivot very deliberately to ensure that they keep as much of their player base as they possibly mm -hmm. can. It is not something where they plan on losing people after the final shape. Mm. I think they want it to be a dynamic chapter and they want it to close out the line dark saga, obviously. But 
I think they want to present a really compelling reason for people to keep playing. Mm. If they don't do that, Lord help us, because, you know, what have we been planning for this whole time? Because you can't just plan on close, you know, you can't close the book and then be like, oh, by the way, here's the outro credits. It's three episodes, you know. That doesn't make sense as far as their revenue structure is concerned. Yeah. And I don't believe that they're going to do that as a result. Yeah. I also, I'm also going to go ahead and say, this will not be the last expansion. I, I know. Yeah, I was going to touch I've, on that as well. Yeah, I've seen so much doom and gloom from people around the community saying after Final Shape, it's all over. No, 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 no. Let's, let's look at this not in terms of the narrative even for a second. Let's look at it in terms of the raw financial situation. Bungie is going to keep making Destiny because Destiny keeps making them money. So, mm -hmm. simple as that, they're not going to finish it a final shape. They're going to do their best to make sure that there's a compelling reason, narratively speaking, and in other terms, for people to stick around and play Destiny, you know? Yeah. We're still waiting on a potential third Darkness subclass. I know there are all the leaks that turned out to be a load of hogwash, you know, whatever. We are still waiting on Darkness subclass number three, the extra improvements in Final Shape that are coming to light subclasses imply that there's more work being done with them and that even more work will be done at some point to pick up the Darkness subclasses yep. and pull them along. You know, there is a lot still to do with regards to Destiny 2 in this game. Mm -hmm. And I think that that also points towards the potential future of sitting there and saying, hey, if Destiny 2 saw the conclusion of the Light and Dark saga, is this potentially just setting up things like, say, a Destiny 3? where we get that full loot reset, where we can approach a new game with a fresh set of eyes, you know, all of this stuff. Yeah, spawn. Oh, yeah. Honestly, uh, <laughs> it's. I think it's worth nipping in the bud because, <laughs> again, I see so many people, creators included, and no disrespect to them if they are, because, you know, we creators especially have a reason to be concerned if the game suddenly stops because all of a sudden our livelihood is in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. No, it's not over. I, I, I'm just going to go ahead and throw that out there. Bungie will be the most aware of this because they are the ones who are financially dependent on it more than anyone. Yeah. You know, so it it's not going to end here. The only thing they can do to make it end is to do something so repugnant as far as player um, sentiment is mm. concerned that they literally drive their player base away, mm. you know? If Final Shape is another Lightfall, uh, yeah, they they will have done that. Mm. But I don't think that <laughs> I don't think they're going to do that. You know, they are so hyper aware of all that that I don't think it's going to happen. No, very yeah. well said. Yeah, very well said. You touched on a lot of points that I exactly also was about to say and always thinking of, like especially on the point of expansions. That was the biggest question I was wondering. I was thinking, like, hang on, is this just going to be? episodes from now on so it's going to basically be just seasons without the expansions but i even rewatched the um rewatched the showcase today just hear the exact words that joe blackburn said but obviously they skirted around it because obviously they don't want to announce new expansions or try and jump the gun but they also kind of want to keep players interested and kind of let them know we're not done but he did he worded it very very carefully but his exact words were um as part of another sentence he said it's not going to be just episodes and he emphasized how there's still lots more devs still working on destiny 2 and there's more stuff in the pipeline so obviously he's not gonna he's not gonna say we're doing more expansions but you can read between the lines but he did say the exact words not just episodes so the mm -hmm. the kind of big question is what happens after episode three is it just and they, they pretty much said it's going to be episode four five and six but maybe after episode six there'll be an expansion so we might reach a point where there's expansions every two years like a big expansion or maybe it's not uh, i mean i feel like they could do again this is me just backseat developing but i, f I feel like uh you know a witch queen lightfall ish size expansion maybe not lightfall um w witch queen ish expansion could be possible maybe every two years or maybe every year and a half or two and a half years but i think in between every three batches of episodes they are going to do, I think, the odd expansion. How big it will be, I don't know. But Bungie also tweeted, they said, basically addressing people, questioning what's going to happen after episode three. And they said, literally verbatim, like, Destiny is not going anywhere. It's not going to end after episode three. And they said, um, it's far from the last big story they have to tell. Basically meaning, again, they have more big stories down the line. And as you touched on many times, which is spot on, financials is the key word here because again we, we talk about it a lot but it's very important to remember Bungie is a business 
not a charity. They're not a just company that just makes games just for the fun of it. Obviously, they do that as well, but they are also a business. You need to have a successful business in order to even make games. They obviously want to make good games, but you can't do that without the business intact. And the core foundation of Bungie's business is Destiny 2. It's keeping the lights on. It's paying the bills. It's generating tons of money. You know, there's been a lot of rumors and speculation. We can't know for sure unless we see the accounting, but we all know Bungie is making very, very good money from especially Eververse and, of course, seasonal model. That's why they're kind of rearranging things so that they can get still good revenue streams without having to do... Because I think they're probably not... I think they realized it a long time ago, but they probably make more money off of microtransactions, the events, and the seasonal model pass than they do off expansions. If you think about how much time does it take for them to develop a whole expansion all the voice lines and the animations and all the just the amount of new content and the amount of developer resource it takes to make expansions is huge and all they're charging is what like $80 for the expansion or there's all different versions of it but versus the money as we saw recently they also are charging what $80 for the season of the worthy armor set yep. in eververse which caused a big a big fuss as yeah. as expected something that used to cost Basically, these skins that used to cost like ten dollars. Mm -hmm. Now you can buy them for eighty. You know, some people are saying it's kind of fair because it was meant to be an exclusive. If you're playing during season of the weather, you get it, and if you want to get that stuff now, you have to pay. But at the same time, it is like a bit just wild to see eighty. I thought it's a lot of money. Like if you think about the things in the real world you can buy with eighty bucks. Like to think about you buy some three skins from season of the weather. It's like the value of it always gets muddled. But um. Yeah. You could do that, or you could buy literally any of the big AAA releases that have come along. I mean, I mean for, for, the, for the Lord's sake, I mean, you could you could buy the, what, I think there's like the digital only deluxe edition of the final shape is either 80 or 100 bucks. I can't remember which, but like, mm. you know, it's, it's comparable. Like, yeah. do you want this whole expansion or would you like the skins for th this season? Oh, and Tommy's matchbook, that... Oh, so renowned of exotics. We can't forget about Tommy's. <laughs> I have definitely forgotten about it. <laughs> I completely forgot that existed. Cool looking gun, but you know. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you've seen the release of Payday 3. And if you're thinking about picking it up, then entering this code will get you 10% off it or any game using my link through Kingwin. This is one of the most trusted places to buy games cheap, fast, and safely with 24-7 support. They email you the game code instantly. And as you can see, I used Kingwin back in 2014 to get Far Cry 3. So it's a site I trust myself. They have hundreds of thousands of offers on any game you want and it's much cheaper than anywhere else. So again, my discount code will get you a further 10% off your basket. So unless you love wasting money and overpaying for games, you should use Kingwin and the code UPLAYER to get 10% off. The link is in the description and the comments and thanks them for sponsoring the episode. But yeah, going yeah. back to the business of Bungie, as as you said, Bungie is more aware of the business and what makes sense for them than the players. And as much as we like to think that we know a lot about the game, Bungie's know, Bungie knows way more and is way more anxious and on top of things than we think they are, than they come across than they are. And yeah, they definitely, it's not in their best interest for Destiny to just go offline or for there to see a massive player drop off so yeah Bungie are definitely more invested than they probably appear in keeping Destiny 2 alive because there is no marathon without Destiny there is no other games the matter and all the other mobile games and stuff they're working on Destiny is still the bread and butter so while they're trying to expand they still need to keep one foot firmly planted on the Destiny to be able to try and branch out into other things as well but yeah, so there definitely will, I say definitely, it's almost more than likely confirmed that there will be more expansions because as Bungie said, this is far from the last big story they want to tell. But it gives them a lot of time to just kind of figure out when they want to do that. So I would imagine there might be another expansion, but they'll just do them on their own time whenever they, not whenever they feel like it, but whenever they're able to and whenever it makes sense. Um, I think raids is another question as well. Like obviously with that expansion, yeah. does mm. this mean that this final shape witness raid is the last raid? Probably not. Again, raids are a huge undertaking, but I would imagine we'll probably see another raid at some point in the future, but could be a so, while. Yeah, they, uh, they actually posed this question to Joe Blackburn recently in an interview and 
his aunt his answer was pretty cagey if i'm remembering yeah. correctly yeah because the because the the uh the seasons it's not seasons the episodes rather come with a dungeon key mm. which means you know at some point during the year we are getting dungeons yeah there's two uh, but there's nothing that was stated about raids no. so it's a very interesting question at that which you know it doesn't really have many answers uh, at even this moment in time reprised raids as well like what the as far as raids to come back there is obviously wrath the of the machine wrath. that's it but well, then I there's mean, the mini yeah. kind of there's the destiny 2 raids that have altered like leviathan scourge crown, crown. eater and spire mm. um obviously eater and spire being raid layers but still pretty good pretty good raid experiences um especially eater quite like eater of worlds um but that's also stuff that they can just bring back out of the vault reprise raids but rather be the main one but obviously i would assume wrath would the whole big thing is that is it would make sense to come alongside with siva which i could also see them doing maybe in an episode or even an expansion i could see them like wanting to do siva properly and have a little spin-off or you know they can make i'm sure you'd know they, they could come up with any narrative to make it make sense of you know we've got this new this we've discovered how to turn Siva friendly or we've discovered how to use Siva in a different way or some other enemies got hold of Siva. But I, I think that could that could be a thing. It's definitely just, you know, something they've got in the back pocket that would make players interested. Um but yeah, we're getting two dungeons in the year of Final Shape. So between episodes one and three. Um there's also the ever growing topic of, I guess, sunsetting and vaulting content. Um as far as removing old content, this is you know, it definitely still raises the questions of the problem's still there of the Destiny, the Destiny files just constantly growing as as they're always adding new content. So, will there become a point where they have to remove content? I remember Joe talking in um, I think it was PC Gamer article. He talked about that, and he kind of he said how he didn't he didn't comment directly on whether episode content will stay and how long for because I don't think they even know exactly and they don't want to promise anything, but. It does raise the question of eventually are they going to start to need to start to need removing content that is just clogging up the game and taking up too much space and also content that is underplayed we know they like doing that a lot um mm. but yeah i think that here's the thing <laughs> i think that uh one of the major downturns and gripe points for bungie generally that was kind of seen by the community as a massive own goal was beyond light and a significant part of the reason why for that is sunsetting and i think bungie is very conscious of that own goal partly because of the fact that the comments about sunsetting still come back to haunt them even now but also partly because people complain and i think rightly so that they've paid for these expansions they've paid for these experiences yeah. they've paid for these destinations and these weapons and these pieces of content, including raids in some instances. And now it's just this thing of, okay, well, I can no longer access them. If you own the base version of Destiny 2 and you wanted to go back and play the Red War, you can't do that anymore, right? Mm. And Bungie has done something to sort of, you know, uh, bridge the gap just a little bit by making these uh, timeline reflection missions. But that's one mission out of every campaign that's just designed to catch you up. It's really not enough. Mm. So when it comes to it, yeah, there's a very legitimate um, complaint to be had there because people have paid for this. And all of it just makes me think, again, at some point they are going to push for a Destiny 3. They're going to try and make it so that the next generation of stuff that comes along is going to be one inside a completely new game a new platform that allows them to start over Refresh. again with something that's a bit fresh, right? Mm. Having said all that, I don't think they'll sunset. I, I, I really don't. I think that they would be, they'd be mad to sunset things right now. Mm. And unfortunately, they're aware of it and they're just aware that that means that the file size is going to bloat for the foreseeable future. Mm. You know, there are some things that can be done to fix that. And I don't speak to this with any bit of technical knowledge. So what I'm about to say could be completely moot, but I know that Warframe has done a data crunch because they were also getting quite bloated. And I think they went from something like 120 gigabytes worth of disk space for their entire game down to something like 70 or 80. So what it's not Destiny impossible. Oh gosh, uh, that's a very good question. I, I remember at one point, like years ago, I remember it was like I think 150 or something. It was like, it's, I think they got it down to 100. Yeah. It was... 
Let me see if I can things. look this up in Steam, because this is actually a very good question, and I'm not totally sure of it. But it's always um, a ever-growing problem that is is a very modern modern age problem. Like back in the ah. day, games were just on a disc. How big is can you fit on the disc? But now it's like this constantly growing thing. Yeah, so I'm not sure if this is a... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if this is a commentary on the latest install or whether this is the entirety of my size, but according to Steam, my installed file size is 105 gigabytes okay. for Destiny 2, which considering that that's something like five expansions worth of content, mm. that's quite a lot. But, you know, also worth remembering that even if you've not installed any of those expansions, you still get access to all the worlds and the expansion that you buy is technically just an access key to all of that content, you know? Mm. So yeah, realistically, everyone's game file size is that big, but you know, thinking about how much you get out of that. I mean, I've, I, I, you know, it's bloated, but I've heard of much more bloated games, mm. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, it's a very modern was, thing. There was that thing of, what was it, Warzone or Call of Duty? I can't remember which one of the uh, things releases. Yeah, it was COD, but I don't know if it was Warzone specifically or whether it was one of the CODs in particular. But wasn't it this thing of they were starting to get so bloated on that that it took up the entire file size of the PS5 that it was coming to get played on? Like, yeah, it's I don't been know. a big thing for COD, which is strange because they release a new game almost every year. But right. yeah, it's, it's a very, like games used to be just like, Bit on a little CD back in the day, and once you got like back in the old <laughs> old days, it was the game would be released, and that's it. There was no such thing as patches or updates or DLCs. It was the game is the game. It's like you play GTA Vice City. It's just like this is the whole complete game. It's done. There's not going to be any change. I think was there even a way to do updates or? Well, I guess even in PS1 and PS2 days before online internet, you know, it was just like this is the game. Yeah, this is the no game. Patches. If it comes with a bug, it's it's bugged. That's it. I mean, you know. But there weren't game-breaking uh, bugs. But nowadays, developers are yeah. a lot more like... But they also do it because they know they do have the freedom to update later. They are a lot less... It's not that big a deal if there is a big bug, which, you know, I don't agree with, and it's definitely not a good thing. But if there's a big game-breaking bug, it's not the end of the world. They can just do a day one patch, or they can just fix it later. But it also incentivizes releasing products that aren't polished and finished, which is a huge... That's the common criticism against this current kind of model of mm. games, how they're released. You know, it's very interesting that we bring this up, talking about Bungie in particular, because they're actually part of gaming history as to the dangers of not having day one updates. And much as the story is about a mistake that they made years and years and years ago, it is actually, I think, to their credit. Have you ever heard of Myth? The Bungie game? Yeah, the yeah. Bungie game. So I don't Myth know much to about it, I just heard about it. Yeah, no need to worry about anything to do with story or anything about how the game is played. It's literally just a logistics thing. But mm. back in the day, Myth 2 Soul Blighter, the ex the expansion, sorry, the second, uh, the sequel to the original came out. What year? Uh, this, oh gosh, this is sometime in the 90s. In the 90s I was going to say, is it 19 or yeah. two, <laughs> the 1900s, last, last century? Uh, this was, I want to say that this was post-marathon, but I'll be completely honest, I need to brush up on things and look over my Bungie history again. Might be actually, uh, yeah, either way, regardless of when it was, mm. Myth 2 Soul Blighter has a really interesting story, which is that it came with a uninstaller bug. And um, what would happen is if you tried to uninstall Myth 2 Soul Blighter using the uninstaller, mm. it would brick your entire PC. Eesh. And this was a bug. This was bad. And when they discovered it, copies had already shipped in everything. So yeah, what they ended recall. up doing... Yeah, they did that massive recall. And to their credit too, because it was a huge financial decision that cost them a lot of money. But in all fairness, it was the correct financial decision. And that's what's really interesting about this entire thing, because, you know, if that happened nowadays, and <laughs> it reminds me of uh, Bethesda and Fallout 76 and a bunch of other things, where oh. uh, no refunds were offered for Fallout 76, which shipped as broken, uh, blatantly broken and just total shambles, right? And, you know, <laughs> people in Australia literally took Bethesda to court to get refunds, right? And succeeded as best I know. But, like... In those days and ages, you couldn't necessarily day one patch things in. You know, you couldn't sell an incomplete product without any consequences that would be lasting towards your reputation and whatnot. Mm. And, you know, granted, Fallout 76 is the kind of other parallel example of today's games. 
is definitely a massive reputation hit for Bethesda, but also it's just worth remembering that, like, you know, you can see examples of how back in the day these bloated file sizes and unoptimized games and anything in between wasn't even something that development could even account for. Mm. It was this thing of it must be at a certain level of polish before it even ships. Yeah. Otherwise, we are screwed, mm. you know? It's kind of a good thing because it enforces quality as opposed to just like, ah, it doesn't really matter. We can just fix it later or we can just do it. And then obviously, you know, another huge um, common criticism is holding back content that if you, you know, if you got, if you're going to release a game in September and then you've got an expansion planned for December, it's like, mm, like, why isn't that just kind of part of the game? If you already made, again, back in the day, it would be, let's just make all the content we can. And then it just goes into the game. If you're just making content and then you're like, okay, we're going to release that in December and sell it. And then we're going to release that one, an, a, another expansion in March or whenever. It's like kind of the, the whole splitting out the content. Again, it makes sense from a business perspective. I'm not cr critiquing it from a, I'm not critiquing why they do it, but it's definitely something that just a lot of players are a little bit sick of is just the rationing out of content over a long period of time when it all should be because back in the old days again it used to be just a huge game like gta is just a classic example and you just get it and then it's just like here's all the content then maybe a long time later they started doing the expansions and other storylines but yeah it's definitely changed a lot but going back to I, the if, if i might make if I might make one more comment on that, though, yep. that's the problem with us gamers, right? Like, we have this insatiable appetite for content now, mm -hmm. and that is a thing that continuously needs to be fed. And mm -hmm. much as everybody, you know, there is some correctness to the idea that a lot of an expansion that releases three months after a main game's release is already done. Mm. Uh, you know, the reality is that it needs polish, and without polish, you'll end up with the Myth 2 Soul Blighter situation again, or the Fallout 76 situation again. Mm. So it's like... You know, those three months are they, you know, they don't exist in a vacuum. And it's not as though you can turn Fallout 76 into, you know, a, a great masterpiece of whatever in the space of three months. But mm. it is to say that in that three months, a lot of important work happens, you know, mm. like, and I'll say this crunch. too. We make, I don't know about crunch, but, you know, more polish, right? It's mm. the, uh, it's that thing too of just us sitting here and being like, hey, we're gamers. We're not game devs. We don't know what the truth about everything that goes on behind the scenes is really like, you know? I feel like we should so, rename this to the Backseat Podcast, where we just... <laughs> I mean, that's what anyone really does. I mean, it's, what we, it's, it's what we're doing. We're just speculating and talking and, and, and discussing what we think. But that's kind of the point, is that we mm. don't know behind the curves and how things go. All we, all we can go off is what we see. So that's, yeah. um, that's what we'll do. But yeah, the final thing I was going to say on the episodes is that it is, it is smart in the... You know, the seasons, as you'd attest to, the seasons in Destiny the past couple of years have been very, very strong. Just the story and the, again, it's not to everyone's taste. Some people don't like it and they only play the expansions. But the seasonal kind of cadence of story has been very successful. So it is smart that episodes are going to be more of that. And they said they're going to be focusing more on the cinematics and more on the story. So it does seem like they've basically pulled what's the most successful out of the seasonal model and are just doing that more. But again, mm. on the other side of that, the expansions are definitely the glue that hold the seasons together. And there's a lot of players that don't really play the seasons. They just come back for big expansions and then they'll kind of, it's a game of how long can this expansion keep me? How many seasons can I last until I get bored and start playing something else? But yeah, it's in, in, in some sense, it's good because the what's successful about the seasons is going to continue. But in the other sense, again, that glue of the expansions that you know is, is going to be coming very soon isn't going to be there so and especially with it being self-contained i wonder about the retention of that um they did talk about the the raid of final shape which can be interesting as we've talked about it's just like you know i guess i i guess the witness is going to be the raid boss that would make the most sense but they've said there's going to be seven missions in final shape which is yeah, it's, it's a little bit anticlimactic. You know, the biggest, the biggest grand expansion is a bit like, wow, seven missions is kind of like, is this, is this it? They, they better be some really, really good missions and no strikes. Yeah, that's. But then I they mean, said there's going to be uh, the raid, which is going to be the bulk of defeating the witness. But then there's going to be another mission after the raid, which is going to be the actual conclusion. So it's not going to be like if you don't play the raid, you won't see the conclusion of the witness. They're basically, you can kind of read between the lines of what numerous Bungie devs have said, but they said it's not over after the raid. There'll be one final push 
And then there's a lot of people speculating about like, you know, a big 12 player mission or a big um, kind of similar to Vow Disciple, how after the raid there was the um, mission, kind of a follow up, which is very, very successful. I think this is a play on that of, and also makes sense that you can't really have similar to King's Fall where you killed Oryx in the story and you killed him properly in the raid. This will be similar where you probably get close to the witness or defeat some form of him in the seven mission campaign final shape. And then you've got the raid, which is actually against the witness. And then you've got another mission after, which anyone can play. You don't need to be a raid to play. And that will be some big, huge final stand where you actually defeat the witness. Yeah. So here's my hope. And I'll say this before I actually get into my hope. Uh, yeah, seven missions plus raid plus one final mission. That format worries me. Right. Because seven missions for a campaign you got to remember the campaign is the vast majority of what most people will play. Mm -hmm. Day one completion rates on raids and the involvement in them, you know, it, it's it's improved. It's got higher, but mm. the actual day one completion rates, especially for contest mode, very, very tough, very low. So my hope is that in seven missions, we do get a coherent story end. Here's my hope, though, right? They've already laid out that, hey, you know, they are taking a lot of cues from the Taken King and the way that they did the story of Oryx. And what this makes me hope is that they've tied this in with how they say that the destination is going to evolve. So here's what I think is going to happen. I don't know this to be the case, but this is my hope. We get the seven mission campaign. We make our way to the monolith. And my prediction, at least, is that we find a way to, quote unquote, disconnect the witness from the traveler, right? We essentially free the traveler. At this point, the destination opens up for us, right? And when the destination opens up, all of a sudden we have kind of the equivalent of the Taken War Act of the Taken King expansion, where a bunch of additional quests will appear that aren't technically in the main campaign, but they're the post-campaign pre-raid questing arc, mm. right? Where you go around the different bits and pieces and you experience the story. And as a result, the campaign is only really a part of it all. And then when you do finally complete those, you are geared up and you are ready for the raid. And at that point, we get the raid itself and then the final mission to cap it off. If that's what we consider the whole story to be, which would be, you know, maybe it's a bit of a, maybe it's a bit of a dream on my end of things. Maybe it's a bit naive, but yeah, if that is the way that the structure of it all works out, then I think that that is a way of telling potentially a really good self-contained story. Mm -hmm. You know, for years we went ahead and talked about how the Taken King and Oryx was really the best villain story in Destiny. And, you know, for the longest time, rightly so. I think it's only honestly topped by Savathun, but the reason why everything works out in the way it does for the Taken King expansion is because Oryx was the focus the whole time, you know? We defeated him in the story, but he wasn't really dead, and we all knew that because we'd done Crota, we knew how Hive Throne Worlds worked, mm -hmm. and that Oryx was still technically around and his influence was still there. But we had the aftermath and the effect of him having basically arrived in the system and said, hey, here's the Taken. You know, we had to purge them from Mars and Venus and uh, Earth. And you had all these interesting missions that you did in that process that were wild and unique as a result. I mean, mm. going inside the Vault of Glass is probably one of my oh, favorite yeah, examples. Yeah, the Taken making their way into the Black Garden is another good one. Like... All of these different examples of great story content came from that Taken War arc, you know, and it's really unique in that respect because I think it was one of the first times in a long while that Destiny's actually done that. And to be brutally honest, even Witch Queen didn't do that. You know, granted, Witch Queen had a great story beforehand with Savathun, which was fed in through the seasons, and the actual campaign itself, I think, stood on its own two feet. But mm. if they're looking to tell a cohesive story about a villain entirely like that, I think that taking that Taken King approach is a very solid way of doing it. Now, again, to be clear, that's a bit of a pipe dream. It's a bit of a hope because we don't know what's between the raid and the end of the campaign. We know there will be post-campaign questing because that's inevitable. We don't know how solidly it links together. My hope would be that it's essentially like a combination of the Taken King and Forsaken in the sense that you know, the world of Forsaken evolved around you. And granted, I'm twisting it a bit because the Dreaming City evolved after the raid. But imagine that, you know? Imagine the Pale Heart evolving when you complete the campaign mission, uh, the final campaign mission, that is, um, 
and then it's like, hey, you've opened up the post campaign questing to do this stuff in the raid. The destination becomes dynamic. You learn new things. You mm. get more context. You understand more about the witness. And then finally, the raid comes and you take the witness on for good. You yeah. know, that I think would be the way to do it. At that point, you have a three act structure, and act one is the campaign. And if that works, and if everything that we've learned about the witness in the seasons prior is pulled in appropriately, if people can get that full context, I think it'll work. But I won't lie, just based purely on seeing the numbers, it is boring. So we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, seven missions is still seven missions or seven plus the one. And yeah, as, as like you said, there's a lot of players. We all assume that everyone raids. There's a lot of players who don't play the raid and don't have five other friends to play this extremely mind punishingly difficult activity on contest mode and even after obviously it's a lot easier but you know getting people together it's not it's not something that everyone has access to um but yeah i definitely think there's i can see a lot of inspiration they've taken from forsaken as far as this big like as far as it just being this kind of like dreamland or first off as far as also being this kind of giant monolith the uh, monolith in the middle and how it will kind of evolve and they did similar things with Beyond Light, how after the um, the space station crashes, you can kind of, kind of see the ruins. And then what was it in the throne world? The pyramid like activates and you see after the raids completed, there's a evolution of the world. I think and definitely from what they've said, the pale heart is going to transform once you get in there. And then once you beat the campaign and then probably after the raid, once you beat the witness, it's all going to open up and change. But um, yeah, cause you can see definitely a lot of similarities there i think on the pale heart itself there was obviously uh something that people will always critique is any reskins or reused assets obviously there is some there's what there's the tower there is the i saw there's the cradles in there as well yeah as there's the practically Cosmodrome stuff wall. from there's practically stuff from every destination just yeah. remixed and whatnot it's a nostalgia and granted trip. there is also a lot of new stuff and where yeah. it is new it isn't being it's shown. kind of wild I'm not too concerned, honestly, about the reskins in the Pale Heart. I don't think it's as big a deal as some people are making out to be. I don't think the whole thing is going to be just, you know, a bunch of stitched together areas. And even the areas they have used, like the tower, they've done a lot of overall. It looks very differently. It's like this abandoned kind of post-apocalyptic um, state. Because obviously it isn't the real uh, tower. It's a version of it inside the travel. It's all like a dreamland, basically. But I think mm. there's... There's going to be a lot more to the Pale Heart than just what's been shown off. And yeah, you can like walk around the tower, but it's you know, it's kind of reminiscent of, uh, I'm not sure if you know, like Black Ops 3 Revelations for the last like big finale of the zombies that they did this map, which was like a stitch together of all the classic um, zombie maps. And it's kind of this big nostalgia pack, which was very, very successful. And it's kind of a similar thing they're doing here, but not... Not in the sense that the entire Pale Heart is all just reskinned areas. As we've seen, there's way more new areas, but they're just chucked in those nostalgic old things like the Cosmodrome wall. I think I saw something of Venus in there as well, maybe. It looks kind of like the Venus Ishtar Cliffs. Um, mm. But I think it's just, it's a very, it just makes complete sense. Again, not everyone always likes it. Sometimes I don't even like it, but nostalgia is very smart because it's kind of like a win win because new players who have never seen it. It's brand new to them. They're like, oh, wow, look at this cool new space. Look at this tower. Look at this um, area that's new to me. Whereas old players like us will be like, oh, you'll get the nostalgia of, oh, this is a cool area that you have memories with. So whether you're new or old, nostalgia just kind of works. And it's just uh, it's just something that makes sense from their perspective, I think. I think also, the uh, for me, the really exciting thing is seeing the new areas of the Pale Heart because... Oh my gosh, Very have you seen looking. some of the architecture that surrounds The Witness? Like, Bungie made the point in the trailer of sitting there and saying that it looks wrong and it looks broken, but not necessarily broken. Yeah. Like, it's just made wrong. Yeah. I, I love the description of that, but also the imagery they've thrown out there. It's weird spiral shapes made out of thousands of hands and arms. Yeah. You know, it's people in statue and silhouette forms but they've been cut apart at perfect parallel lines and it's just like all of these weird images that feed into a very eldritch feel which for one is perfect for what the witness is but also is terrifying and i think gives us that bespoke feel that has always kind of been attached to the interior of the pyramids but now is properly and completely expressed mm. and 
you know, if I may jump in momentarily with the lore, it makes sense with what they're saying about the Pale Heart, because apparently it's a dimension and a space that reacts according to those who experience it, mm. right? Subjective. So at the heart... Of. Yeah, I mean, kind of. The, I, I coin a phrase here, so excuse the, excuse the babble, but it's what I'd call a psycho-mutable space. In other words, it's literally changed by your own mind mm. and your own consciousness, mm. right? So it's kind of like a throne world in that sense. Mm. The witness at the very center of it has been there for a while, has built its monolith out of its own kind of thought and its ability to mold the traveler around it. When we arrive, all of these spaces start popping up too, like the tower and everything that we've experienced in our journey. Mm. It reacts to what we've experienced, which is a really weird uh, way of looking at it. But, you know, it shows that progression of, you know, ally to enemy almost. And you can start to see the furthering points of corruption the more and more you go through. And I think that that's a really interesting choice, but also it's great because by the time you do get to the end, you're going to see those wild visuals and it's not going to make sense. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to that. Like There's it's like going to be a bit mind bending. Giant spiral of like these hands that look like kind of like vertebrae, but they're like hands. And there's another one with this giant, like kind of human looking face statue is like looking out with his like, again, hands like in your face. And there's, was some kind of giant like dragon skulls a lot of just weird stuff kind of like inside a pyramid ship but some of the best looking um architecture because it's just weird and abstract is the probably the best word to describe it and it's also yeah. going to be linear which is interesting so it's going to be not just a circle of different areas cobbled together it's going to be a path which i'd imagine there have to be a lot of um fast travel points if you want to get to the end i would definitely imagine they'll have some um fast travels um on the mm -hmm. map but yeah, the fact that this linear is definitely interesting. You can even see one shot in one of the trailers where you can see, I think it's from the witnesses um, monolith, but you can see all the way at the end, the triangle portal where you come through the traveler and you can see the whole path. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. Um, I think another thing that a lot of people are talking about and a lot of people are hoping is of course the sixth subclass or the third darkness subclass that of course is absent i mean it's not really absent because it was never really announced but it was definitely mm -hmm. um anticipated i think rightfully so because it definitely is just thematically it's kind of like a gaping hole in destiny's like symmetry and it's kind of like an imperfection of having three light subclasses and just two dark subclasses but yeah. i think i think there's a reason i think the reason for it is simply they didn't have time i'm not sure how much they seriously planned on doing um a third subclass i think they probably realized a long time ago probably at some point making through i think before uh stasis before beyond light i do think they had planned to do three subclasses in all three expansions but as we know things changed and obviously they added a fourth expansion mm -hmm. i think they realized like it took a long time to make stasis and then even a year to just about balance that and some would argue they didn't even do that like enough within the year and then they realized you know we're doing strand I think if we were getting a whole new subclass in just a couple months, it would be it would seem a little too soon, and I would wonder whether the subclass would be as good as the first two because Strand and Stasis. I think Strand especially, I think, is still one of the best designed subclasses as far as all the little mechanics and the perks and where they interact and just what you can do with it. I think Strand is the best designed subclass we've seen, and I think for them to do a sixth one, they're gonna need a lot more time. So yeah, it's a little bit disappointing. There were some leaks about, I don't even know if they were real or not, about the um, like the developer screen with the red oh. subclasses. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure at this. I want to say that Joe Blackburn came out and debunked those rumors, and basically it's all fabricated, which, mm. I mean, that's the case with like 50% of rumors, mm. but, you know, say la vie. Mm. I do think that the, um, the actual subclass idea and the proposition of it itself... Uh, not the idea of a red subclass, but the idea of just a third darkness subclass after something like Resonance or something in that ballpark actually does make a lot of sense. Mm. Where we actually find it is going to be a totally different question, though. So we'll need to sit there and figure that out. But I think yeah, it's, I a, it's a very good tool that Bungie are just saving their pocket for the future of, you know, when they do some kind of expansion in the future. I would definitely imagine that will be a big... Um, I think it just makes it, again, as much as I wish there was a new subclass in Final Shape, I think I can definitely see a, a day where they just announce one big expansion and a whole new subclass. That subclass is a huge thing that draws players in. It's probably 
Probably one of the biggest things that makes an expansion interesting is a whole new damage type. It's a massive, massive change. So I think it's something they're definitely just saving in their pocket for a future day. Again, I do wish there was the th all three, so you can kind of tie a bow in it and have one nice, neat, symmetrical, three light, three dark. But I just don't think it's feasible for that. And I, clearly, it's not feasible. If, if it was possible, they probably would have done it. But... I think they're just saving it for some kind of future expansion. It definitely will be a big token they have to draw players back in because when they announce a new, you know, whatever is red or yellow or orange darkness element, yeah, people will definitely be very, very hyped for that. There were, I saw some people kind of speculating maybe it's, maybe they're just keeping it as a surprise, but definitely not. If there was a subclass man, in this, I, they would be marketing I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know. Because here's yeah, the might thing. Be. I don't I, I don't want to go ahead and hype people up for this because mm. in my mind of minds, this expansion having light subclasses because it's inside the heart of the traveler, you know, that makes sense. Mm. But the witness is here inside the heart of the traveler and it has been changing it and turning it and corrupting it. And mm. you know, there's a part of that that just makes me think that it's not impossible. And I don't want to say it because you know does sound like the kind of thing they'd throw up there immediately in the marketing, yeah. especially of the way they did Strand, especially with the way they did Stasis, but there's a part of me that would be really, really excited if we just walked through and, you know, mission two of the campaign, we, we face up against the Witness prematurely and it's clear that we can only just barely scratch the surface of its power, but in scratching the surface, we pull away a little bit of the fabric of what makes the Witness powerful mm. and we get resonance or something. You know, that I, would be... I do think it's possible. Oh, I, wow. I it, was, it was the first thing I thought of is, oh, maybe they're just saving it. it does it, It's a, it's a bungee thing they would do of trying to just keep it as a surprise. It's something they did a lot with Forsaken. They kept a lot secret. And even with um, even with Destiny 2, they didn't even announce the third yeah. subclasses, the Taken King subclasses. They kept it as a surprise. Um, I remember making a few videos kind of pointing out they did let it slip a few times. There were a couple of little things yeah. that suggested it, but they kept it hugely under. They did a very good job. And then pretty much up as until, Destiny 2, a couple of weeks up before. Until the, yeah, up, up until the point at which media outlets yeah. were given the go-ahead to post their footage and none of them followed the guidelines yeah. correctly and just showed the map in their footage and didn't edit that out. And that just was like a week or two before, I remember that. But yep. yeah, they did keep that as a surprise, but... I think, I don't know, I'd say maybe like a 10% chance they're keeping it a surprise. But I think just the just the kind of marketing business side of me thinks it would be such a huge setting point. They would want to advertise it and it would be a reason to sell and make copies. Like we saw how many traders they released for Strand and um, Stasis. They would want to be, it's the number one reason of, hey, buy this expansion. So I feel like they wouldn't, they'd be doing themselves a disservice, but... I do agree. It would be very cool. And it is a thing that Bungie could possibly do. So it's not, I, I don't think it's a 0% chance it happens, but it's um, it's something that would be very, very cool. And it is a, something that is 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 definitely in the Bungie um, kind of ethos of trying to reserve some big surprise and then just drop it on the day and everyone's kind of just freaking out about this whole new subclass. Or like imagine if you just beat the raid and then there's just like new element unlocked. That would be, that would be really cool. Yeah. Defeat the witness, get to use its power. That's a great way of selling the new raid, right? Yeah. I think another thing that Joe Blackburn touched on in um that article was about new enemies and he said about, you know, people are always asking about will there be new just an, a new enemy race or a whole new enemy type. And he said, which I I, th I think I disagree with him, but he said that it wouldn't be interesting and that pretty much their way of doing that is by adding new types of enemies like the wyverns and the hive guardians tormentors and then now the subjugators that's their way of adding a new enemy type but he said pretty much that it wouldn't be that interesting and he, he, he said that it pretty much wouldn't be as exciting as players think it would be to add a new enemy but i know i disagree i think just having a whole new enemy would be i i think i don't know whether he genuinely believes that or whether it's just kind of like from a logistical game standpoint of retention numbers it wouldn't be that much of a draw but i think it would add a lot more hype simply seeing again not saying they should because it would be a huge undertaking but you know if there was just a brand new enemy type i do think that would be a lot more interesting than he kind of said in the interview what do you think about what do you think about that 
I, okay, so I don't want to speculate about the perspective that Joe is coming at that from, whether it is based on his opinion or whether it's based on logistics. I imagine that, uh, I imagine that there definitely is a logistics side of it, which is very tricky to manage. Mm. What I would definitely say, though, is that, um, when you actually go ahead and take a look at the game and the enemies that have been added over the years, tormentors and subjugators are, and hive guardians for that matter, they're big ticket encounters, right? And that means that you have the ability to... Th and wyverns too, for that matter, mm. because they were added in Beyond Light. That was what you mentioned, you know, yeah. Yeah, they define a encounter space, right? They are a big thing. They're a big piece upon which most of the other stuff rotates, right? Like, if you see a wyvern coming at you in a Grandmaster Nightfall, that is your number one priority. It's over the boss, it's over any of the ads, it's over champions often because it will storm you slowly but surely and it will beat you if you don't deal with it properly very annoying so if you take one enemy and have just one really well designed combatant i get that like i i can kind of understand where he's coming from on that side of things but i think that that's i think this is where it becomes more of a logistics thing because i'd love to see not the whole oh this is a encounter defining thing but i'd love to see something where we do get a new enemy um, faction, I'll call it, because, mm. yeah, I think that's the correct term. Uh, because, you know, it's not just about having interesting and dynamic fights. It's also about novelty. Mm. Like, I don't doubt that the combatant team is going to be able to make some interesting fights with a new kind of combatant um, or a new faction worth of combatants even, you know? Like, they've proven they can make dynamic enemies that change the way that you fight and change the way that you approach PvE situations, mm. you know? That's nothing new. We we see that that is entirely possible, and we see that that will be something we need to deal with in the future. I would, however, really I think that's even more of a reason for them to make a new faction, though, because you know you don't need to apply all of that learning to every single enemy. Like you don't need a whole faction worth of Hive Guardian level type enemies, but you know, I think there is a deeper understanding of what cap uh, players are capable of. I think there's a deeper understanding of what the combatant designers at Bungie can do. And I'd love to see them apply those lessons to a load of different combatants, you know? Like, the last time we got combatants, we got the Scorn. And I know they're not everybody's favorite enemy faction to fight, but personally, I think that they present a really interesting combat challenge. Mm. And I think that they have presented some of the more interesting mechanics to work around. You know, whether that's chieftains and their totems or whether it's just how bull rushy they are compared to a lot of the other enemy factions Screebs. you fight. You know, screebs, mini screebs for that <laughs> matter. You know, like there's a lot of stuff in terms of like the scorn kit and arsenal that is interesting and I think is worth building out. And, you know, there's a reason I think why overload champions are so interesting to fight for the scorn because it can be any three of those totems that you fight and mm. each of them is the amped up version and it makes your overload interaction with them that much more sort of mm. important. Either way, maybe this is just the opinion of one person. I imagine there's someone in the comments who absolutely hates the scorn and isn't buying a damn thing of this, but the point is they've learned a lot since Forsaken. I would love to see them apply all the stuff they've learned from making these new combatants to an entire new enemy faction, you know? create the most interesting versions of enemies that you can that do fill those roles even if some of those roles are chaff mm. you know I, I, yeah i i, I want to see them make a new faction i i much as i know that it's it's probably joe's perspective and he absolutely knows more about game design mm -hmm. because he has the big overview of the studio it still doesn't change the fact that as a player i would love to see a new enemy faction yeah you know? And I think with that, it's something you see a lot with Bungie's communications recently is they, they talk a lot about pretty much like how they talk about the pretty much return on investment. Like, is this worth the resources? Because as we know, Bungie is, they have a lot of developers, but clearly most of them aren't working on Destiny. There definitely aren't as many working on Destiny as they used to. So, and that's been definitely kind of a, I think it's taken a bit of adjustment for, I think, a lot of players because Bungie definitely... Um, in the player's defense, Bun Bungie were not very transparent about how much they were shifting their developers towards other games. So, like, and we'll probably talk about it later, but the PvP is a classic example. They, you know, PvP clearly looked underdeveloped for a very long time. And players are like, what's going on with Crucible? Why is there no updates? Why are they not? Why does it seem like Bungie doesn't care much about Crucible? 
And then we pretty much had to force out of them. Then Bungie said in the state of the game how basically we don't have the resources to do that. And we don't. And they said, oh, well, now we're going to have a strike team, a dedicated strike team to work on Crucible, which is like, I guess in their eyes seemed as like good news. But in the player's eyes, it was like, well, hang on, you've now made a strike team for Crucible? Like, what happened to the original Crucible team? Like, they kind of, they never properly announced that they were moving all these developers away from Destiny. But then they announced when they're bringing them back and it kind of like, well, hang on, since when was there not a Crucible team? So why is it, why is it such a, why did it take this much for you to have to make a strike team to then put some resources into Crucible? We thought it was always like that. But again, I can see both sides, but Bungie definitely weren't transparent about and again, it sounds like, you know, kind of entitled, entitled consumerism, kind of like, you know, why aren't you telling me about your development process? But Bungie definitely kind of, they seem surprised by the community surprise that there weren't loads of developers yeah. still working on. And see, this is the thing, right? Because I think it is a bit of give and take. Like, absolutely, this is, there, there is a little bit of a demanding side to this. For sure. But by that same token, there's also a lot of Bungie having just not listened on that front for a long time and I th maybe that is a bit harsh because I not listening and not doing something aren't the same thing mm -hmm. not listening big, yeah, to something and listening and just not being able to do something yeah is is something like point. that I think it's just it got to that moment where it was a boiling point you know the pvp community was fed up mm. and I think it also was that the the sort of crossing of a rubicon uh where people sat there and were like look listen we know you guys don't think that PvP is worth the investment, but here are some numbers. Like, almost half the player base plays the Crucible mm -hmm. on a regular basis. If you're disregarding them so consistently, they will just take their ball and go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not impossible. There are lots of good multiplayer games out there. I mean, we talked about Warzone and everything else going on, but Apex still exists out there. Everything to do with other games that are big in a multiplayer sense still out there hasn't gone anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you want to just reach for a big name out there, you're looking at competition from something like oh, Fortnite even. So let's be real for a second. Bungie is in this place where they weren't necessarily responding to what I think was very valid player criticism for a very long time. And that's, you know, it, it's it for a PvP player out there like Ganada Jake, I imagine that it's one of those things of sitting there and being like, yeah, I've been trying to say that for years, man. <laughs> like, you know, it's it's definitely frustrating. I think it's good that there's a strike team now, but it does reveal that there was some deficiencies with the way that Bungie was approaching how PvP content was served, mm. you know? Even Joe in the thing said it has been underserved. You know, in his 15-minute uh, Twitter video, if I'm not mistaken, he did say that it is underserved. I hope I'm not getting that wrong because, yeah, I yeah, he do said, believe he said I remember that. much along those lines, and he, said, he reiterated it in the state of the game, and yeah, that was the gist of it. I'm not sure, verbatim, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, yeah. you raised a very good point about the, there's a difference between not doing something, them not doing something because they aren't able to, and them not doing something because they don't want to. Like, with Crucible is a perfect example of, a lot of players saw it as like, is Bungie incompetent? Do they not know that Crucible is underserved and that needs his attention? Are they trying? Like, a lot of people saw it as if, and I could tell by just a lot of the way people talk about Crucible, they talk about it, they used to talk about it in the sense of, like, why isn't Bungie doing anything about Crucible? Do they not know? Like, are they incompetent? Are they trying but failing? But it's actually not that at all. It's more of the case of they very much are aware, but they made the decision a long time ago. Again, not saying I agree with this, just explain what the situation was. But they made the decision a long time ago to shift developers. Clearly, the majority of um, Crucible developers are working on Marathon and their other PvP-ish games. But this wasn't Bungie underserving Crucible because they're just useless and don't know what to do they were very consciously aware like no no we're aware that there's the crucible is the way it is and we're doing you know we're doing the most that we want to do they're not not doing it because they're incapable that bungie is very capable studio if they wanted to divert their entire workforce onto just destiny it would be a completely different game but the reason they're not doing it is because they are just prioritizing okay we want to work on marathon we want to work on this area of destiny we want to take developers away from a lot of it is take developers away from the content that, you know, Crucible doesn't make much money. That's also another harsh truth about Destiny is that it's free to play. The majority of players who play it are free to play. There isn't a lot of even making maps. There's not money you can make off of that stuff. Whereas the um, the PvE side of things, there's lots of money to be made there. There is the season passes, there are missions, there are 
um, obviously microtransactions. So it's kind of like a, a case of them just diverting resources away. But yeah, it wasn't Bungie's to to to, to cap on this. Bungie's lack of lack of um, development on Crucible was definitely deliberate. It wasn't like an accidental. Oh, we're trying, but we just don't know what to do. It was a very deliberate. Like, no, we are just going to leave this mode kind of as it is. Do some tweaks. Do some fixes. And then once there was a huge fuss about it, rightfully so, um, now they've said, okay, we're going to make a strike team and actually address some of these pain points for um, Crucible. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to go too far back to the state of the game that was released because that was very much the topic of our last creator chat. But man, the uh, yeah, I, I still remember as far as the sentiment for the community PvP side in particular was concerned. I think that's the lowest low we've had in years. Mm. You know, it's... The Crucible has always been quietly kind of discontent, except for a few moments of levity, kind of like around the 30th anniversary update and a few other times. But man, it's, yeah, uh, I, I can't remember a more frustrating time for PvP content creators than that, you know? And you can tell because it bleeds into the rest of the game too. When the PvPers are upset, they make a lot of noise and everyone else can hear it. Mm. I hear it and I'm the law guy, mm. you know? I... I barely touch the crucible, but if someone is mad about it, I'm going to hear about it because mm. it's all my Twitter feed will be for a while. Mm. And I'll just sit there and be like, well, I'm just over here enjoying my lore and my PVE. But um, yeah, the people in Shax's realm of things are mad. So I know about that now, you know, and it's I, I don't even want to say that it's just about the optics or the communication side of things, because it is important in other aspects. Right. Like this is a general point of player communication that sometimes gets missed as far as the mark is concerned mm. so you know it, it is it just based on purely the idea of understanding where player sentiment is and understanding what your players want out of your game it is important to get that right you know there was also something that aligns with everything we've just talked about um i remember i'm pretty sure it was the pc gamer article where joe talked about how he talked about bungie's kind of Bungie's kind of uh, intentions and the general sentiment around Crucible. And he said, I remember specifically saying how since 2020, Bungie seemed unsure and kind of uninterested in the future of PvP. He was kind of, he said that he was, as he became the, the game director, he was asking and wondering what's going on with PvP. And he said that he got the sense that Bungie pretty much wasn't too interested or concerned about investing in the future of PvP. And it was kind of, you know, he didn't say, I'm putting words in his mouth. He didn't say it was a lost cause, but... That was the gist of what he was saying is that Bungie doesn't seem too interested and that he then tried to rearrange some things and make sure there was more effort put into PvP. But I remember him saying also how he said, or I think Bungie seemed to come to the conclusions that no other game developers are able to maintain both PvP and PvE at the same time. It seems that they had kind of analyzed the market and been like, you know what, games don't seem to be able to maintain both PvP and PvE. So we're just going to try and make PvP as good as it can be. And it'll always be there as a way to mess around with weapons and take weapons that you've earned from the raid and see how they are in the Crucible and Trials. But essentially that PvP is not and won't be the priority and that they're going to lean more into the PV PvE side of things. But the gist was him saying that he got the feeling when he first became the game director that Bungie didn't seem too interested in Crucible and that he was going to try and fix that and change that or do it as much as they can but again you know if Bungie if, if the leadership and higher ups have decided PvP is not um, worth all our investment then there's only so much that individuals can do or even any amounts of tweets can Which, do. Which I'm gonna go ahead and say I think is completely uh, completely off base and I say that and it, it's kind of a tragedy because they are the living breathing proof that you could have really great PvP alongside really mm. great PvE and they did it in Destiny 1, you know? Destiny 2's early life cycle, too, had what I would consider bad PvP at the start. But when Forsaken came around and eventually there was kind of this meridian where things kind of smoothed themselves out around about Season of Opulence, mm. yeah, people were really into the PvP at that point. Like, it was a good time to be playing in the Crucible. Mm. I would sit there and honestly say that they are the living, breathing proof that it's possible. Mm. I think it's only when you take a look at something like, say, Overwatch 2, where developers aren't experienced at delivering content at that pace, where they have to pick and choose. Mm. Bungie has that experience. Mm. As far as the live service industry is concerned, 
they are the veterans. Mm. They are the standing stone that allows everything else to sort of orbit, you know? Yeah, the only example. So I think that was yeah, kind of know, what but, he was yeah. getting at in just the sense that they looked around and said, you know what, no, we're pretty much the only game that is even doing or trying to do this both hybrid of PvP and PvE. So is there even much point? Should we just lean into one and just kind of are we are we operating the most kind of efficient we can if we're still trying to do something that no other games seem to be able to do? But yeah, it was interesting when he said that. It was a very um, it was a very uh, in depth article where he talked very and and Joe's done a very good job at communicating a lot of things. And even the video that he made in response to obviously the state of the game, which wasn't very well received, his um, his video was was very impressive, especially for developers who aren't content creators who aren't yeah. public speakers. It's very a lot harder than it seems to speak to a camera and speak concisely and to raise good points and address millions of furious, angry gamers. It's a very, very difficult job. And he, he did and has been doing a very good job at communicating. But obviously the downside of that is you become the lightning rod and if anyone's complaints. So it's a very, very tough job. It's why community, community managers come and go and they kind of, there's a, there's a certain lifespan of how long you can be in the hot seat of answering every single complaint that anyone who has a twitter account um has but um yeah they're definitely doing definitely doing a good job at communicating and being yeah. open even if whether you agree or disagree with what they're saying it's always interesting to at least see behind the scenes i think if, if i might speak to the whole side of joe blackburn really quickly uh this is going to sound like a bit of an odd tangent but i worry for him um, and I worry purely because at a certain point he wants to go on and uh, like do some streams and just play the game for a little bit, mm. you know, partly because of the toxicity side of things and partly because streaming is an environment where you can't entirely control what's going on. Yeah, and live. every single thing that happens to him is going to be put under a microscope Recorded. and that's just, oh God, you know, it, he's a human being. Things are going to go wrong because things go wrong for human beings, not because Say he is incompetent. You know, like there's going to be a moment at which something happens that is imperfect. There's going to be a moment at which he's going to, I don't know, Lord forbid, like he lets something slip at mm. that point because he is a human being and he's out there working on all these different bits and pieces. Mm. And it's not always clear what's in the live game and what isn't. You know, I know that sounds ridiculous to a player, but you got to remember this is someone who is working constantly on the game, both in the stuff that's been publicly announced and the stuff that hasn't who is playing a demo version of the build on a somewhat regular basis and then is playing the live version of the build. Mm. Some of these things are going to get mixed up and confused. Mm. And it's not, you know, it's a human thing. Like, this is not incompetence. This is him having to deal with the reality of juggling, like, four or five different versions of this game, three of which are in progress and one of which is live. Mm. <laughs> you know, so it's... It, I, I, I fear for him on that front of things because this is the best communication we've gotten. And I think him actually putting his face and his his words to the camera on this mm. showed us the sentiment from within the studio, which was crucial to winning players back. It is the most important thing that came out of the state of the game is his 15 minute video because it showed that, hey, we are receptive to feedback and I do care about this. And mm. it wasn't this thing of we care, Bungie, the entity that does not have a face to it. It was I, Joe Blackburn, the game director cares. I don't want him put under a microscope because mm. everybody makes mistakes and everybody has these moments where it's less than perfect. And if you are in that place where you don't know everything about the game to the same level of depth as some of your core PvE or PvP players, you're going to come across as ignorant when the reality is, no, we are hyper-focused on these things. Mm. And he's an overarching game dev that has to look at the whole field, mm. you know? He can't know the in-depth knowledge of stuff to do with how weapons function down to the T. You know, he is not as knowledgeable about weapons as Cool Guy is. Let's be, let's give an example of that, mm. right? And that's because Cool Guy understands how the recoil pattern of things works according to the number that's shown on the recoil direction mm. thing. You know, it like, I don't expect Joe to know that because he's dealing with bigger stuff. He's the game director. Things. He's not yeah. even like community manager is a whole separate job of having to be the mouthpiece of the company. But yeah, it's a weird one because on one hand, it's definitely like we've seen, especially for the past, I guess, since since Dylan left, it was um, you definitely saw uh, it's kind of like an absence of a human face of Bungie. It's nice to have a person that represents Bungie. But at the same time, it's almost I think we've talked about it before, but it's almost an impossible job of trying to be that face of a whole company. And, you know, when it's good, it's great. And when people are excited and when people are reacting positively to his video, it's good. But 
what happens when there's a backlash and people are furious about something, then it's a lot more tough. So it's it's a very difficult job that I wouldn't really wish on anyone and hope. Yeah. He's doing it well so far, but I I would imagine he's kind of going to just um just keep it keep it at a certain arm's length where he's not the actual like weekly yeah, absolutely. like weekly blog posts or weekly updates from Joe. I think he'll just touch in every now and again, but like I said, his job is game director. His job isn't community manager or um mm -hmm. content creator like his job isn't to make these youtube videos and speak to communities he's going above and beyond doing that which is which is impressive i think i'm i'm gonna go ahead and say this now because i think i have a platform in in this particular place and i want to make sure that i make use of it now if you are a player and you are looking at this video and you are listening to all of it i want you all to remember this most crucial part to it when you sit down and you think about anything that Joe Blackburn says and anything that comes around when it actually happens, uh, he is one of the best avenues of communication we've gotten in years. And we want to keep that. Yeah. We as a don't community, mess <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't, ruin don't this. mess it up. I knew please. you were going to say that. I, I had it, a it's, 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 it's you know, I'd this. be remiss. Yeah, I'd be remiss to say it because here's the thing, right? It, th this is the this is the fine line that I think we always talk about, but it's so hard sometimes for people to come across and actually do anything about, right? There is a difference between critique and being harsh and being an ass about things. And I would know because I failed at trying to find where that line is on a regular basis, right? I still personally feel, and let me give you an idea of sentiment, right? When Lightfall came out, I gave my massive critique video and that hit 12 on trending across all of YouTube. That is the most dubious honor I've had in more recent years. And the reason for that is because whilst players generally, and I, I will go ahead and say some developers sat there and said it was valuable feedback, equally there were some players and some people in the industry who sat there and said that I was being rather insulting. And you know what? On reflection, after I'd calmed down from everything, even though like, there were no expletives, even though it was one of those things where I felt like I delivered concise feedback, I agree. I don't think I was respectful enough when I did that. And even just voicing that idea that I wasn't necessarily as respectful as I could be, that got backlash from players. Mm. The idea that I should have been more respectful got backlash. Mm. And so I need everybody to understand we can't exist in that e echo. Uh, well, it's hard. We can't exist in that kind of ecosystem of communication and still expect people like Joe Blackburn to come forward and be like, hey, this is what we're going to do. Mm. We've seen this feedback. This is how we're going to answer it. We, we just can't expect that level of feedback. We can't expect that level of interactivity. And do you know why? Because people are human. Yeah. You know, I sat I sat there and I didn't call anyone at Bungie any names to the best of my remembrance when it comes to that video. But my tone throughout it was aggressive and it was you know, it was consistently angry because I was disappointed, mm. right? I wasn't pulling an angry Joe and screaming at the screen, but, you know, it doesn't help get any of the feedback points that I made across. It's one of these things where if we phrase this correctly, it serves everything. And we must, we always must critique. But we should really worry about the way that it presents itself. Because you sitting there and then saying, wow, I can't believe you made this idiotic decision, Joe Blackburn, for one, is not actionable feedback. That's not feedback at all. That's not critique. That's just you insulting someone. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to actually giving feedback, we need to make sure that we're pinpoint clear about what it is, mm. you know? Which is why I'm really looking at the PvP community right now because there are a bunch of people who have been giving feedback lately because Bungie's asked for it. You know, yeah. this is our prime moment where we can sit there and help improve the dialogue from our end. Mm. If we give them concise, actionable feedback, as I know a lot of good PvP content creators have been doing recently, yeah, then we can actually help to ensure that this dialogue that we've got and that's really good for us stays around, you know? So that's all I'd say. We've got to change the way that we talk to developers. Yeah. Like, not just in this community, but across the entire industry. But yeah, it's got to be better than what we're doing right now. Yeah, it's always you know? something that's just going to be tough with when it comes to the internet. When you have, when you have millions of people that all care about something that can rally... There's always the potential for toxicity. And it happens in anything. If you, you know, followers of a musician or, you know, a film or like, you know, if it's a TV show that the, the writer, that people don't agree with the direction the writers have taken, it's always going to be the case of just, you, you definitely see the worst of it online. 
And that doesn't always re reflect the general 90% of casual players or casual players or viewers or watchers or listeners who consume something and just kind of quietly get on with it. But it's always going to be a case of, I don't know, and especially in this final year of Destiny, people are extra critical and people who don't play anymore and kind of either like the game or people who don't play anymore and hate on the game, they're always going to be kind of very much... Um, I don't know, like a peanut gallery, always commenting on wh whatever happens, mostly negative. But then, of course, when it comes to just human psychology in general, negativity always rises to the top. We're more interested in things that are negative because it's just more interesting. It's just how the human brain has got. A, we've got a negativity bias built into us, which is kind of like a survival mechanism of you're much more threats are much more important to pay attention to than good things. If it's a oh, what a beautiful sunny day, it's nice. Yeah, it's not really too important. Is there a tiger coming to eat me? That's important. So humans are very wired to pay attention to threats, danger, negativity. You look at the news, it's all just threats and doom and war and just crazy stuff happening and murder. Like it's all what naturally we draw towards. So you see on the internet that rises to the top is negativity. Like if you made a video talking about how much you like Lightfall and then you made a video talking about how much you dislike Lightfall, which one would get more views? It's just a natural way of how we work, but it's also on people to just kind of be a bit more... I don't know, not take things so much so so seriously. But it's it's not just in Destiny or in games. It happens, you know, literally with say Game of Thrones. I'm Anything, sure yeah. the writers were getting death threats and you know, people take it so seriously because they're so passionate about it. But it's I guess it's easier than done to tell people that are really passionate about something to calm down. But then by the same metric, you have people who just play this game for fun as a hobby, who have jobs and Destiny is just fun for them. They're more passionate and more toxic and more just crazy than content creators who literally make a living off of playing and posting a game. So right. there are people who are like us who are more invested in Destiny's success and we're much more calm and level-headed and just like, you know, it is what it is. We'll see what happens. And then you have people who are just kind of like it's a hobby for them and they're, you know, sending death threats and, you know, talking crazy to developers. But yeah, it's definitely I a weird <laughs> one. And I don't I think it's going to get, I think yeah. it's going to continue up until Final Shape yeah. because it's a very, the stakes are high. The stakes are very high. As I, as I said at a certain point with my final critique of Lightfall, where I talked about all the good and all the bad, you know, I sat there and the very first thing I said was addressing the kind of the way that people are way too passionate about some of mm. this stuff. And I, I literally used that line, like, I make a living off of this thing and you are angrier about this than I am. Mm. It ain't that deep. Yeah. You know, I, <laughs> it's, yeah. I'm, I'm re you know, I don't mean to bring it back up, but you're a hundred percent correct. Like it's, we got to remember that there are bigger fish to fry as far as what your priorities should be. And mm. if you are one of those people sending death threats, I'm just going to say this, and I, I want to try and be compassionate about it, but please get help. I don't mean that in a plea. <laughs> no, for you know, sure. I, I, don't, I agree for I don't, sure. <laughs> you know, like, I don't mean to be facetious about it, but like, if you're in that place, something isn't right. You know, either you're just, you know, you're actively posting and it's, you know, sure whatever but you need to get a better sense mm. of humor because that stuff legitimately is going to get mm. taken to the police in some really bad instances mm. in other times if you are in a troubled place please you've got to direct your energy to helping yourself Stop like it. you know it's just help. actually yes 100 <laughs> percent that it's but no it's <laughs> it's something you see and again it's the entire internet but it's i don't even know if it's it's, it's never going to stop but you can always try and do your best but um yeah people just kind of take things way too seriously and you see especially a lot on Twitter a lot of people who are just like you are very kind of bent out of shape about something that there are bigger as far as things to be concerned about happening on this planet there are much more things like you should be outraged about this this that 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 before this game you don't like or this musician made a song you don't like or this TV show isn't as good as you thought it would be like it's but who knows I don't think it'll ever be a it would be a solvable problem but um yeah, I think it's definitely not gonna it's definitely not gonna slow down. I think as the as the final chapter approaches of Destiny, I think people are a lot more watching with eager eyes of how's this gonna go down. But yeah. Um what do you think about the something very interesting is the leveling system changes. What are your thoughts on that? So pretty much overhauled the um the fire team power of I think it's a very, very smart system of someone on your fire team who's the highest level can pull all the other players to close, pretty much the same as their level, and kind of eliminates that the feeling of falling behind and not being up to certain level. And 
I think, yeah, I think it's a very smart system. On one hand, it's kind of a shame that they have to do it, that the leveling system means nothing, that they can just implement a system where it just gets auto-locked to whoever is the highest level. But at the same time, I think for where Destiny is in its life cycle, it makes perfect sense. And, you know, as you said earlier about the whole 200 levels in the season pass in the episodes, it's kind of uh, one step forward, well, one step forward and a couple steps back. But um, fixing the leveling system in the sense of not having to worry about are you the right level and just getting kind of who's the highest level. Yeah, we're just kind of all around your level. I think it's a very smart way to just simplify things and not make people feel like they're left behind and also is a good incentive for you to still grind and be the highest level because you want to be the guy with the highest level that everyone else can then mooch off and now you feel good that you know I grinded to become level 100 and now everyone else gets to be level 95 because of my hard work so I, th I think it's kind of equally rewarding but what do you think about it? So I think there's two facets to the system that are worth talking about. For one, it's what you've said th thus far about how, yeah, everybody's level is brought upwards to that kind of very sort of vague plateau of somewhere around the highest persons. Mm. And the other side of it is how some activities are fixed in difficulty. Yeah. As far as bringing players' levels up, uh, that is a necessary move. And absolutely, I'm glad that Bungie's doing it because it, and for context, it doesn't completely remove the chase of things. Because people, assuming they are actually able to get into the endgame content, will still want to hopefully do it because the rewards out there are very good, right? You're still probably going to want to run things like Garden of Salvation if they are part of the, like, let's say this is back in Shadowkeep at the very least, because I know people have probably got all they want from there and red borders don't drop from that raid. But yeah, let's say you are playing Garden of Salvation and you don't have Divinity. There is a reason to rerun that raid so you can get Divinity. And in the process of doing this, I think you will naturally level up. Div is probably the worst example because it is attached to Garden, but, you know, the entire point is you're not locked out of these things and it's more of an incentive to keep running with those groups. I think this isn't just a good idea, it's something that's necessary for Destiny to continue player retention. Mm. And their stated aim of making sure there's as few barriers to entry to Destiny's yeah. endgame content as possible, you know, that's a good thing. That's a very strong position to be trying to approach this from. Mm. Um, as far as the other side of things, of having some activities that are just set power levels, good. Because you know what? I would really like to see and enjoy some raids that are actually a certain base degree of challenging every time. You know, like being able to overlevel things is, I mean, it kills some of the leveling and some of the challenge that is inherent with Destiny and which makes it entertaining. You know, we always talk about how we'd love to have contest raids around, but the example that really jumps out to me isn't that. It's actually GM Nightfalls and how they keep me coming back because it's actually challenging content. Yeah, they get fixed. And, and I, I grant, like, uh, <laughs> the uh, I feel like the battlegrounds are a little bit much. Maybe that's just me. I, I The battlegrounds are way harder than typical oh, right, Nightfalls. Right. Yeah, the typical GMs... Too. Yeah, they're long, but it's also built on the foundation of a battleground where some mm. encounters have enemies that infinitely respawn, where effectively it's asking you to perform to a very different standard and it's not designed around a system where you have limited ammunition. And, you know, like that's some some part of that is moot because of the power creep that we've experienced because, you know, now we have so much more potential for ability spam and everything else. So, you know, to a certain extent, that's just me needing to get good, but... You know, the point is still there. A challenging GM activity is very satisfying because it is challenging. And bringing that around to the rest of the game is very good. And being able to sit there and say, hey, there's no barrier to entry for this. And this is as hard as it's meant to feel. You just need to make sure that you're getting better at the game and embracing the challenge of it. Yeah. That's a good place to be, I think. Kind of so, removing yeah. the unnecessary tedium that doesn't need to be there and just kind of as we always say, just cut out the anything that anything that is, as you said, a barrier to entry that is preventing players from playing something they would normally enjoy. Yeah, because there's a lot of content in Destiny that that is kind of behind these grind walls, and eliminating that is definitely just going to just expedite the process and hopefully get players closer to fun stuff that they want to do. I'm sure you've seen the release of Payday 3, and if you're thinking about picking it up, then entering this code will get you 10% off it or any game using my link through Kingwin. This is one of the most trusted places to buy games cheap, fast, and safely with 24-7 support. They email you the game code instantly, and as you can see, 
I used Kingwin back in 2014 to get Far Cry 3, so it's a site I trust myself. They have hundreds of thousands of offers on any game you want and it's much cheaper than anywhere else. So again, my discount code will get you a further 10% off your basket. So unless you love wasting money and overpaying for games, you should use Kingwin and the code UPLAYER to get 10% off. The link is in the description and the comments and thanks them for sponsoring the episode. And there's also the um, the LFG system, the Fireteam Finder, which is coming in season 23, which I guess will be mm. the last, the final season. Um, and they said they wanted to get that out before Final Shape so that it's basically polished and how it how how it can kind of not be, I don't know, buggy and have some issues. So it should be a lot more fine-tuned by the time the Final Shape rolls around, which is when it'll be most important because if they were to launch it with Final Shape, yeah, there might be some issues because that that Lightfall, the, the Final Shape braid is probably going to be probably going to be very very uh handy for some kind of a fire team find it looks pretty good i mean they, they did say it's going to be um they're going to be uh taking away uh, guided games which is interesting remember the introduction of guided games was a uh, mm. pretty much the first iteration of it and even said in the in the showcase he said like it was still technically in beta <laughs> which is no promises of why they're able to just take it away but uh guided games is finally going away and it's going to be replaced by the proper Fire Team Finder, which is their ultimate version of um, an NFT system, which is going to be interesting. Yeah. And I hope that it works better than Guardian Games. <laughs> yeah, I completely forgot about Guardian Games. It's always there. I mean, it, it does <laughs> we all we work. all did. It's just a little the little orange triangle. Like, oh yeah, Guardian Games. It's just Guardian Games well, like, is games finally even. coming out of beta. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's funny. I remember in the showcase when he when he was asked about. Um, guided games. He was like, "Yeah, that's uh, that's gonna be, it's gonna be going away finally. It's gonna be, it's mm -hmm. still in beta technically, but it's gonna be uh, taking a little, a little backseat." A long six year beta. <laughs> but yeah, uh, nice hopefully, but, beta. Hope, yeah, because yeah. uh, launched with D two, right? Oh yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Did. Either way, I really, I you know, I hope, I I pray that the system works as intended and that. It doesn't have any overarching flaws and that everything is going to be fine. Uh, it still remains to be seen, but, you know, we'll we'll figure it out as we go. And Bungie is now at that stage where if something isn't perfect, they're sticking with it and they're making sure to actually push it and ensure that it is better at function. I imagine that the next thing that's going to be proof of that is an overhaul somewhere in the future to commendations and how they work. But, you know, take a look at how Trials loot, for example, worked. When it relaunched back in Season of the Worthy, awful, terrible. Nowadays, even if you're not winning, you can actually get some half-decent loot from Trials. So, you know, it's okay. Another game mode on the similar topic that um, they mentioned way back in the um, state of the game was Gambit. Poor Gambit. Um, they said uh... some some stuff that some players agree and some players disagree with about pretty much the the loop of Gambit doesn't get enough engagement therefore we're going to put less resources into it but then because it get less, gets less resources it's a less good mode and because it's a less good mode less people play it and then because less people play it bungie see those numbers and be like oh look less people are playing this mode let's invest less in it let invest less into it so it's kind of like a constant cycle of less investment less players less players less investment and they just kind of it just eventually spirals into its grave and they've they've pretty much said they're just going to kind of you know no more updates, we're going to leave it where I think they're doing yeah. some stuff for it, but it's kind of... Keeping it on maintenance mode, basically, yeah. right? maintenance mode. Um, but yeah, they essentially can't justify the amount of resources that it would take, and I think it's kind of ran its course. I think it has a ceiling on how far you can even develop it, because it was a cool concept, PvE, VP. Um, it was, Gamble was very, very cool when it first came out in Forsaken. It was, it was really fun, but... I guess it's ran its course and a couple broken weapons and sleeper simulants and LMGs and kind of things kind of soured after a, after a while. And I guess the, con the concept of invasions as well kind of soured it. But yeah, it's definitely not a mode that I've um, that I've frequented. But Gambit is, I guess, also meeting a similar fate of guided games. Well, they're still going to be in the game. It's not going away, but um, mm -hmm. it's just going to be, yeah. as you said, maintenance mode. Um they also announced is going to be the new voice actor of Zavala, of um, mm. Keith David, which is very cool. He's yeah. a very iconic voice. Was he in Mass Effect? He was in. He's been in a bunch of things. Yeah. So he was. Um, he was uh, Anderson in uh, 
uh, and I, I wanted to say captain at first because he just start as captain, but eventually he, he gains ranks as he goes on throughout the entire thing. But yeah, Anderson in Mass Effect and for Bungie fans in particular, the most notable uh, voice talent work that he's done is actually from Halo as the Arbiter, oh, which yeah, is a beloved yeah, yeah. character. Right. And I think to touch on this really briefly, there was never going to be a perfect replacement for Lance because there was always... You know, he's been with us for nine years doing this and it all happened so suddenly. It would, uh, you know, my first reaction when I saw the news was, is this is this some kind of terrible joke? Mm. Like, surely, surely someone's, you know, I'm being punked, right? Mm. Um, it was fake. There was no, there's never going to be a perfect replacement. But as far as replacements for Lance Reddick go, I think this is the most appropriate. You know, yeah. it's a seasoned voice actor. It's someone who's known to the community, someone who I think can respect the source material because they have the talent and they have the experience within the industry. It's another gentleman of color, which I think is important to the role and more yeah. importantly than anything else. I think that it pays homage to Lance in terms of just the skill required to take on mm. the depth that he created for Zavala. You know, mm. he is someone who has defined the role as much as any of the writers have, because without his delivery, we wouldn't get the kind of, how do I best put this? Zavala is that person who has maybe three tones of voice, and yet within each one of them, you can convey dozens of different emotions now that we've known him for nine years, mm. you know? We we barely ever see him get animated and angry. We barely ever see him in this kind of somber tone. We've only seen that in the last few years because we've only really gotten to know him at that depth yeah. in that recent time. And Lance, being able to deliver all of that within the timber of just his voice for Zavala, which is a more limited range than what he could do for anything, because Lance has done dozens of other, had done rather, done dozens of other voice roles prior to that. It just shows the incredible talent that was on display there. And if there was ever someone to follow in those footsteps and to really show some appreciation for the role, I, I think that, yeah, Keith David is probably the best choice for yeah, it. Very good and selection. You know, it. like I said, there will never be a perfect choice. And I think everyone is painfully aware of that, but this is the best choice they can make in an impossible situation. So, yeah. And the good thing as well is that the community has, widely speaking, had nothing but um, positivity towards Keith jumping Welcome into the me. role. You know, everyone has... I, I remember when it was announced, you know, Welcome, uh, Welcome Commander was the thing that was rolling around all over Twitter. And, you know, it shows that there's a great deal of love for the character, but also it shows there's a great deal of fondness for both of the people who are involved, both Lance and Keith. And mm. frankly, I, yeah, I don't know. It's always a very sad topic to bring up and I'm left a little bit without words for it, but mm. I'm glad that Keith David is here for this, I suppose yeah. is the best way yeah, to put it's it. it's bittersweet, but it's definitely not a celebration because obviously the circumstances, but I remember, yeah, yeah. we were talking about how it would be very just difficult to get someone else to do the lines. And they obviously, the most important thing is that they're not just doing an impression of Lance. It's not even right. Zavala because it's Lance's voice and Lance has had a very um, unique voice, but it definitely wouldn't, it, it shouldn't have been someone just doing an impression, trying to sound like how Lance used to sound. It would have to be its own separate thing, but also something that fits Zavala. And they managed to do, yeah. uh, they managed to find someone who's de who definitely will be a, a very good fit, a very powerful, deep voice that yeah. I think is going to, mm. I think is going to make a lot of sense. So, you know, it's obviously not good news, but um, it's yeah. at least uh, a very good choice. I think they've, um, mm. I think they'll do it pretty well. And if I may, you know, it's, this is not at all the same uh, instance because I'm, this is over contract things, but, when it comes to the change in the voice actors behind, uh, uh, voice talent, I should say, uh, behind uh, Ikora in particular, um, you know, the the switch over in uh, talent there, I think it's something that Bungie was able to handle and land somewhat well before there. You know, in both instances, whilst it is clearly two different voices, I still read it in both senses as Ikora. You know, the spirit and the tone of the character remains. And I think that, if anything else, it, it shows that the voice direction, I suppose is the way you put it, uh, for Bungie, is probably going to be able to land that, especially with Keith on the delivery. Mm. You know, I, I think that they will capture the essence of who Zavala is still. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, 
I wish I could say something resoundingly positive at the end. I, I guess the only thing I can say is, uh, Keith, we're so glad you're here. Uh, we Respectfully, we wish that it had never needed to happen and that the conversation wasn't there, but we're glad you're here, mm. you know? And from everybody, I guess, good luck, right? Yeah. Then you've got the... Um, the what is it? The uh, reunion of all the original Vanguard and even Akora's obviously got the new voice actress, but in obviously uh, Nathan Fillion, who's fully coming back as voicing his original lines for Cade 6, who I guess will be kind of a uh, character in probably the campaign. Maybe it'll be a vendor for the location, but yeah, it'll be cool to see the three Vanguard, although obviously a lot has changed. Cade's come and gone. And then akora has got a new voice actress and um, yeah. and Zavala too, but yeah. You know, from Gina Torres to Mara, I want to say it's Mara as you know. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Mara. I'm so sorry if I'm not. Um, and, you know, from at one point Nathan Fillion to Nolan North and back to Nathan Fillion now. And then mm -hmm. from uh, Lance Reddick to Keith David, you know, all the Vanguard has gone through an evolution over 10 years, mm -hmm. as I think is somewhat inevitable, but... Mm -hmm. To be completely honest about it as well, it's just, this is this is a part of Destiny's story now as much as no one is going to immediately be happy to hear it. And I think that the only thing that is good about this is that it's all been handled with grace. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. What did you make of the difficulty of the Crota's End remake? It was vastly more difficult than the, what is it, Root of Nightmares, which was... Oh, widely wow. criticized yeah. for being very easy <laughs> the contest mode yeah. specifically um and it makes me wonder the big question is the difficulty for this final shape raid how difficult is a witness going to be because it's obviously goes without saying this raid needs to be difficult like this if if uh the witness raid was the same difficulty as nezarek that oh, would gosh. be a oh. disaster uh, an absolute yeah. disaster so i don't even care if it's just like you know no one even completes I, I, again this is just ridiculous um kind of imagination i don't even know if i actually would want this but imagine if it took like a week for anyone to actually beat imagine <laughs> if it was just so just soul crushingly difficult where it's just like three four days later and you wake up is that like, has anyone beat the rage yet no they're still they're still in this phase they can't get it imagine if it was just so mind crushingly difficult that it took a week like how good of a again i'm not saying i you, exactly you've erased that, last wish but, from your memory it's that trauma has been no, folded I'm hasn't last it? wish <laughs> times five. <laughs> oh, last gosh. wish was oh. what 20 what two teams beat it in 24 hours two, i'm saying yeah, 12 people i want a team to beat it after the fifth day imagine that again i'm not saying oh, i gosh. i'm not sure if that would actually work but imagine if it was just like how again it might not be logistically make sense but as a story, that would be cool for the witness, the biggest villain in the entire 10-year Destiny franchise, to be just this impossibly difficult boss that no one even knows how to beat. And then I don't even know, but that's just my my my, my spitball imagination. But yeah, it, it definitely needs to I be think... hard. Maybe not that hard, but it definitely needs to be a challenge. I think. <laughs> I completely agree. I think the way they're going to try and measure the difficulty for this is that they're going to take what they did as far as difficulty for Crota. And they're going to bump it a little bit more, mm. right? It's going to be one of those things where they want it to be tough. They know contest is now 48 hours, so they can afford to take a little bit more time. But also, oh man, yeah, they, they can't afford, and you know, they know this. That's why Crota is as tough as it was. They know they can't afford to repeat a Nezarek situation. There were Rat King contest clears of Nezarek, right? Rat King clears. Rat King Rat King, you know, I did like, that zero shouldn't be prep. happening. I wasn't even intending on doing contest mode. I just thought, yeah, I'll just do it right after contest mode. I don't want to, I'm not feeling like a super soul crushing experience. I'm just going to do it casually and just do it after the contest mode. But then unexpectedly got pulled into a team and then managed to do it on like really not too much difficulty. And I was like, I should, I feel like I should have had to do a lot more prep to be able to do that. Yeah. But for numbers, um, mm -hmm. It was said that in the first, as far as the first 24 hours, um, 900, or I think less than 900 players beat Crota within the first 24 hours, whereas 17,000 players beat Nezarek in the first 24 hours. So the difference was staggering. Um, and yeah, I think it's just, uh, I think Bungie definitely deliberately made Crota difficult to kind of, it, it makes sense because you want to get make it just a, a fun, memorable experience that 
people respect in a sense that is because Crota was obviously the, the big running thing was that Crota obviously was a very very easy raid boss it was kind of seen as a joke people always thought they'd come back as like a dungeon or a strike that was the thing so I think Bungie wanted to kind of remind us like no no Crota is a real boss and we're going to make you respect him which is going to make him really difficult but I wonder whether the uh, witness raid will be Crota level yeah so to give you a uh, vague idea Taking a look at the 24 hour mark of contest mode, right? And this is uh, th this is what's really important for comparison's sake. Uh, Root of Nightmares, right? When it comes to um, normal mode difficulty, I think it's 17,400 teams. This is a raw data sheet. I literally just pulled from Reddit, but it's got a ton of detail to it, right? Mm. 17,400 teams completed it. So you're looking at somewhere in the region of hundreds of thousands of players, right? When it comes to Crota's End, that's at the 24-hour mark, right? Crota's End, instead, 870 teams yeah, is the is, is the number, right? So, and keep in mind, you know, that's still several thousand players, but that's a very prestigious club, so yeah. to speak. And as far as the prestige of a day one or contest clear is concerned, that's about right. Now, keep in mind, that's both normal mode Oh, I say normal mode. That's both normal clears, right? Crota also has contest challenges which need to be cleared. And for that, the number of teams that were clearing it uh, was only 80 within those first 24 hours. Now, contest does go on for 48 hours now. And to give you an idea of where King's Fall was, you're looking at about 3,000 teams. For the Val the Disciple, you're looking at about 6,500. Mm, pretty consistent. Right? Ron is the clear outlier. Yeah. Forty-five thousand. Yeah, that's that's so, uh, <laughs> that's wild. And especially yeah. in an expansion that wasn't received as well, it definitely was. A, yeah, the raid of yeah. What, what, what do you think about Root of Nightmares now? Re reflecting back now that a lot of time has passed uh, as a raid in general, how do you think it's aged? So, I think Root of Nightmares is this tragic misplaced piece of content and it's something i've said a few different times if root of nightmares had been released alongside an lfg system that was fully functioning i think it would have made a lot more sense you know and bungie would have been able to point to it and say this is like baby raid for babies yeah. because it is designed for people to get into for the first Very time this LFG is an friendly. introductory step you know if at that point you could sit there and actually point to that and say that's the reason why I think it would have been much more widely accepted mm -hmm. by players. Mm -hmm. And Bungie could have put it to the side and said, hey, people who are the day one raiders who get this stuff done within the contest period, just go and have fun. Go wild. Go crazy. You know, and at that point it would have been seen more as a fairground attraction rather than people trying to sit the final, um, you know, the final round of the Galcao exam. Like, it's not sitting there and giving you the major vibe of like this is an absolutely crucially important day one instead it would have been approached in a very different manner mm. it didn't happen that way though and so it's always going to feel like an outlier and it's always going to feel like a lesson for bungie mm. right talk to me about season of the witch what is your thoughts on where's the story going how is going to lead into final shape eris is now a hive god uh, talk to me about what are some of the highlights and what are some of the things that you think players need to pay attention to about the story of Season of the Witch. It's, oh gosh. Very uh, okay, question, I, but I know you're yeah. the man to answer it. So. Yeah, I, I guess I'll open with simply saying it is the wildest seasonal story I think that we've gotten in a while, if possibly ever, you know, like the Vex simulating a shroud of permanent darkness over the city and whatnot, and then that being the manipulation of Savathun, you know, that is kind of an incredible thing to think about in the first place, right? And that was Season of the Splicer, you know? Us working to free Savathun, Season of the Lost and all that, also pretty good. Th this has those same elements, but I think that the actual character drama has never been this pronounced, mm. you know? Seasons are good for different reasons, you know, whether it's the political intrigue and the sort of uh, the incredible story of the dynamics and structure of the city that was told in the splicer, or whether it's to do with, you know, these this tale about what truly makes up honor in the season of the chosen, you know, each story has its vibe. 
This time, the character drama is so pronounced because the transformation itself of Eris into the Hive God of Vengeance is so obvious and so clear. Not just in terms of it's a physical transformation, but also because when you actually sit down and look at the stakes in question, there are so many questions that actually arise from that, right? So is all of this playing into Savathun's plans? Is she somebody who's just trying to continuously trick us again? Is she even going to hold up her end of the bargain? That's one. Is Eris going to permanently transform? That's two. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any, now in week four, we realize, are there any further knock-ons from that? Like, will Asa, who is bound into this ritual, as it turns out, going to be permanently transformed as well? Mm -hmm. That's three. Four, are people going to be able to ever trust Eris again? Five, if Eris does permanently transform, where does that leave her and the rest of the Guardians and the Vanguard? Mm. Six, will she even be able to defeat Zivu? There are mm. questions that revolve around people and revolve around their actions and their principles and a whole bunch of things. And I think that's where Destiny is at its best for storytelling. But also it's taken what I think is some of Destiny's best lore, that wild ability to sit there and uh, just, you know, take everything that Destiny has created and just shove it into the whole story of the Hive, it, you know, that is where Destiny is at its best, mm. I feel, is when you're deep into the things like the Books of Sorrow and the dynamics of Hive Gods and sword logic and these ancient beings with rivalries and kingdoms and power. That's, I think, where some of Destiny's best storytelling has always been, and Especially that makes me the really hive. excited. The hive oh, 100%. Has always been a i think even a bungee favor there's always been there's the most room for just the most interesting stories to be told with the hive and eris is such a long running character since dark below i mean she was even obviously made in just like what was it six weeks as a like a last minute thing but ended up becoming one of destiny's best characters and her long running narrative of getting revenge against the hive that did that to her and now she's gotten her full circle now i'm a hive god and now i'm like battling Zivu like it's a definitely a very very good full circle and like you said especially in a season it's impressive um yeah big question is whether she'll stay like that or is this just a temporary yeah. seasonal thing I mean the indication is that she isn't intending to despite how much the power calls to her mm. and I and, and the question I think is not whether she wants to it's whether she will and whether she'll be forced to stay that way because of some overarching thing in the plot right I have this feeling that if something is going to force her hand, it's some machination of Savathun, or it's just the raw power that Zivu proposes. And I imagine that if she does that, it's going to be because she chooses to and is forced to, but she's going to embrace it because she knows what she's about. She's always been humanity's ally. That's never changed, you know? Mm. And she's going to accept perhaps a role where if she does get forced to make this decision, she's going to accept that some of humanity is going to spurn her. She knows that she is the hero that can't ever be appreciated, and she's accepted that that's her role, you know? I, I'm i a huge fan of the storytelling this season, and that's no secret. I, I, I'm consistently blown away by the fact that this is even happening, but even just down to the little things, you know? The dialogue and the choices of characters that are around this season is kind of genius, you know? It's only realistically dialogue between Ikora and Eris and Imaru, Savathun's ghost, you have some background stuff there from Zivu where she's sparring pretty consistently with uh, Eris. You also have the logs from Savathun. We got some lines out of Sloane and Asa. But man, the lines that are there are... I, I hate to say this because I'm going to sound like, how do you do, fellow kids? The lines are fire. <laughs> you know? Like, there's a point at which Imaru is hearing something that Eris is saying about how Hive Throne Worlds exist. And he's like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who died and made you an expert on throne worlds anyway? And Eris just coldly and calmly responds, Crota. And it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> oh, you're the only person who can say that, you know, like ah. <laughs> when you actually tee up a perfect one word response to things and suddenly nine years worth of lore and story unfolds in yeah. that moment, it's like, oh, <laughs> you know, like that's actually a really fantastic example, I think, of how the great story that Destiny has has been able to bubble up to the forefront. Honestly, I absolutely adore it. I love it. And the, uh, gameplay wise yeah. as well. Seeing a lot of people raving about Sabbath and Spire and just the actual gameplay loop seems to be more yeah. engaging than just a typical seasonal activity. We've seen so many of them. But yeah, I think it's been a very well received season, I'd say. Yeah, honestly. Like, and I'll touch on those seasonal activities really quickly too. I think the big bonus for everyone is that 
Bungie has removed all the restrictions on the grind, particularly for the Altars of Summoning, right? As long as you have offerings, you can continue to get rewards and you can continue to grind. And that's the thing that I think people really enjoy about it. It reminds them of the Archon's Forge and the Court of Oryx back in the day, where as long as you had a rune, or as long as you had an offering, you were able to actually get some loot and make some progress. Mm. And anyone can activate it and it works for all of them. And this is what's so great. Everybody is full up on offerings. You can do this thing all day and still keep going and still have stuff around to get those big offerings and get all that loot. It's it's a really good deal as far as like what you're working with there. And it's drop in, drop out, just like the Court of Oryx was, as except it it's be, not, yeah. you know, it's not tied to a destination. I think that's, Bungie has rightly experimented with what works, but I think this is a really great sweet spot for at least one activity every season or every few seasons to do, because I think it's the thing that people hate the most about Destiny when it's in the seasonal loop is the fact that they limit the amount they can do and they force it to be drip fed over weeks. There are people who grinded out all their weapon patterns in one week. And they're still coming back and playing because, you know, they're still grinding out other things because you can get some reprised Red War weapons thanks to the Season of the Witch engrams. But, like, point is, it's not an arbitrary limit on players' time. And there is no silly restriction there. And I think that's good, you know? And it's... So go on. No, oh, that's it. Uh, that's it. Yeah, on was, activities, that was it. I was going to say that's also going to be very important going into these episodes, as we talked about in the beginning of... If that's going to be, if this is the gist of how the game's going to progress, it's very, it's, it's a good sign. The way they've got seasons now, it's a good sign that they've got that cadence down of storytelling and gameplay loop. If they can keep doing more of this in these episodes, I think it'll be a good sign. Yeah, I'll say this too, and I, I'm going to sound like the massive bungee shill here, so uh, forgive me. This season, as far as my playtime is concerned, has clearly reignited uh, my actual enjoyment of playing the game. So week two, for example, I played every part of the game, you know, including Gambit. Crazy as that sounds. I've actually done almost all my seasonal challenges. I've jumped into the raid again. I've been raiding more regularly. Where I think Lightfall and Season of the Deep kept me around in a much more casual sense where I was taking a break from things. Mm. Now I'm much more openly invested. I barely got to Guardian rank 10 in Season of the Deep. Now I am already four weeks in at Guardian rank 10 and I'm about to move on to Guardian rank 11. It's, you know, it's, yeah. Um, the only thing that may keep me from that is I have to do a run of Ghosts of the Deep solo, which is not, uh, hmm, for reasons I won't go into, that's not exactly looking like a fine prospect that I may take up on the matter. But, you know, just from a pure engagement standpoint, you can see what I mean there. It's a much better time right now mm. to be in Destiny. And I, I think that, yeah, it... Honestly, like, it's a good season right now. Mm. It's a very good season. And at a time where usually it drops off. So I'm very glad to see that that's what's going on. Mm. Bungie's ability to pivot this and to make it a decent gameplay experience after the feedback of Lightfall is starting to come through. And I think we'll see more evidence of that shining through as we get into next season. And it makes me a little bit more hopeful for Final Shape. Yeah, and so, the episodes. Yeah, but yeah that's, um, I think that's all we've got time for on this episode. That was a lot of talking, but there's even more that we could talk about that I guess we'll get through in future episodes. But thank you, bye, for your time and for lending us your thoughts and insights. And um, thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. Of course, you can like the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe. Check out Bife, of course, if you want to see, be up to date on all the story and anything on that front. He has got you covered. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in a future episode.